work that they do with neural translation using mostly professional models. So thank you again, guys. Hi, everyone. Good evening, and uh, thanks for coming to this talk. So I am Sunil Marthi, and this is Jon Gottman. And uh, we both work on Open NLP and a bunch of other Apache projects, and we are members of Apache Foundation. So today we'll be talking about uh, machine translation. So before we start, show of hands, how many guys actually have a use case that's involving machine translation here? And uh, how many of you guys use uh, neural networks or uh, neural machine translation as opposed to statistical? OK, great. So towards the agenda for today is we'll be talking about what is machine translation, what is neural machine translation, and what are the challenges with that, and how do you actually train your models offline in a batch mode and uh, call them in inference pipeline in real-time streaming mode. And we'll have a small demo. Uh, I do need some help and support from you guys for the demo uh, because the demo gods have not been good to me of late. Uh, how many of you guys here speak native German, uh, native German speakers? Okay, three. Uh, well, I was hoping that you guys could tweet in German and you know with the FOSTEM hashtags, and we could actually translate those tweets in real time. But anyway, it's okay. If the, without, the, without the hashtag, we'll just go with German tweets. And uh, let me just warn you that uh, most German tweets that die after 4 p.m. Berlin time, that's, that's when they go to beer bars. Or uh, before that, it's either racist or profane, or uh, you know, one of those different categories of tweets. With that, let me hand over to Joan. He'll take us to the next few slides. So for this talk, we're using um, Apache Flink. That's a distributed streaming and pipeline um, framework. And we have Apache OpenLP. This is used for the pre-processing of the um, text we will feed to the um, machine translation system in the um, demo. And let me start with um, what is machine translation? So we have here this um, definition. We have E, that's the um, string in the target language. That's a language maybe I speak and I would like to translate to. And we have F, it's a string in the, um, in the source language, maybe the one I don't speak, like um, Spanish, for example. And now we want to maximize the probability of E. And the best translation from the model we have is the one with the highest probability. So let's look at how we um, can translate uh, one word. So for one word, you would just go to a dictionary and, and look it up there. Here we have the example of a, a Gebäude, and we could translate this to um, these three words, like building, house, or a tower. Now the thing is that um, two of the words, building and house, are much more frequent than um, tower. But still, you would need somehow maybe look at, you would need to look at the context to see um, which words you want to use which uh, brings us to the uh, parallel text. That's um, a sentence in some uh, source language, and then you also have the um, translation uh, of this sentence. And here we have one example again. Das Gebäude ist hoch, and the English uh, translation is the building is high. And here you see I have uh, four words in German, which um, more or less uh, directly translate to, um, uh, to English. And probably with this sentence, I would get uh, pretty far with a, a dictionary. And, um, but there are more complicated cases. For example, um, this one, das ist ein Hochhaus. And here, Hochhaus uh, would translate to three words in the uh, target language. And my model would need to, um, to deal with this problem because also the um, sequence length is now not the same anymore, so I have more words on the output. Also, in other cases, I can have um, swaps, so maybe I have to um, translate one word and then it would appear maybe um, at the beginning of the sentence or somewhere else that um, wasn't the original uh, sentence. So now we come to uh, the uh, neural machine translation part. And there's this, uh, this very nice slide about the encoder-decoder architecture. And this is what, um, what is used most um, these days. This is a bit of a simplification. We will um, extend it in the uh, next slides and add more. So on the left part, we have the encoder um, um, part. On the right is the um, decoder. And what we are doing here is we are inputting uh, one sentence with this he loved uh, to eat. And then we hope we are getting out er liebte zu essen. Um, so here we have the embedding layer on the left part. Um, and we would take the word he, and this would be pushed into the model. And the first thing we have to do is the word itself um, we can't really use much. So we would um, go to a dictionary 
And this dictionary would give back the, um, a, a vector representation of this uh, word. We have some slides about this, and uh, we will speak about it. Um, so we have um, then a vector for the word he, and this gets pushed into the encoder. And this process um, is repeated for every word, and here this is just like a written out, but it could also be um, more steps or less steps, depending on how many uh, words you have. At the end of this uh, process, that's the uh, encoding phase, we end up with this S in the middle. And this S is a, a vector representation of the, um, of the sentence. So basically, um, just imagine somebody tells you a sentence, and you have to re remember this um, sentence. And that's kind of what's inside this S. And um, this meaning of the sentence, uh, which is now captured in this vector, is then handed over to the um, decoding part of the um, system. So, and they have now uh, two inputs. The first is the S, and the uh, second input is the uh, null at the uh, bottom. And now my uh, decoder knows I would like to decode the uh, first uh, word of my translation, which in this case would be air. And now I just repeat this. I again give as input the, um, the S, and now I input as well the, um, the first word which was uh, translated, in this case that's the air. And this process uh, gets repeated until the entire sequence is um, decoded and I have my uh, translation. To make this um, work a bit better, um, this is usually um, done with something they call attention. And the attention helps me now that, the, um, that on the decoding part, I can look back onto the uh, source sentence. That's like when you have some sentence written down, and you can just always go back to it and see what's written there while you're writing your, um, your translation, so you don't really have to um, remember everything. And with the attention, um, this can look on the decoding part back to the part that just uh, wants to translate. So maybe um, it's looking here at the, um, here's like, um, ich bin ein Student, and the translation is, I am a student. So maybe I, I am at the um, student at the end, and it now is okay, I can look at the um, student word in my input sentence and um, see how this uh, um, should be translated. But of course, this is much more uh, complex, and um, these days, people would usually use something called a transform model, which has like many, many layers for the attention. And at the end, you have the, um, you have the softmax, which would then output the, um, the word. This is um, attention is all you need, so if you want to learn more about this, um, maybe uh, go to this paper, have a look. Um, this uh, probably takes a bit of time to understand this in detail. And so the upper function, let's say um, softmax, function, softmax function, which is used to, um, to calculate the probability of the, uh, of the output words. And the second function, that's the um, entropy, and that's the uh, loss function, which is used for training. Because during training, you um, kind of like initialize everything randomly, and then you want to uh, figure out uh, parameters which uh, um, can be used for the translation. So you run the computation once forward, then you get some, something out, and the loss function then can tell you how you should um, change your parameters. And this process usually repeats uh, millions and millions of times until you have some weights which actually then give you the translation. So can, the training can take a, a long time and um, also depends on how much data you are training on. So why do we do NMT these days? Because it just uh, works much better than what we had before. From around 2015, NMT started to work, and 2016, this was already better than um, the SMT, the statistical machine translation, which was uh, before. And since uh, 2017, nobody is um, doing any more SMT. So here I'm handing back to Sunil, and he will go through some samples. So before we go through the samples, I just quick note on the previous slides. So what happened here, if you look at this graph, what happened between 2015 and 2016? If you see in 2016, the orange bar is way up the blue bar. So that's when Google Translate switched from their traditional statistical machine translation to neural machine translation using attention mechanism. And uh, the advantage of using attention mechanism is that translation happens based on the context. It's not just, you know, you're not looking at, uh, let's say, the three words or four words before translating this particular word. You're looking at the complete context, like, you know, three sentences ahead and three sentences behind to come up with a better translation. So on that note, sometimes you do see that the machine translation is all goes all back, and uh, you may see something very humor, uh, frivolous and 
you know, fun stuff come out of it. Some examples here. So that those of you who speak German, what do you think that is? Is it is it good or uh, you know, is it nearly good or is it near? Okay. So uh, next example. Okay. So uh, even better, if you have been using Twitter or the browser, and uh, you know, uh, can anyone tell me the difference between the original and the translation here? Okay, so it's not Dutch, and uh, when you translate from uh, you know, a mathematical function and you put spaces in between the plus signs, it's a Dutch. It becomes Dutch, right? That's not true. So yeah, that's, that's Twitter, Microsoft Bing. That's what Twitter uses for translation. So how do we avoid those kind of stir, you know, challenges with machine translation? So the first thing to look at is, what is the kind of input that you would expect for uh, machine translation? And uh, since we're dealing with, uh, with the de neural machine translation, since we're dealing with uh, Neural networks here, the input to most neural networks is a vector. Vector is an uh, area of uh, you know, numbers. And uh, the training data for this, since we're dealing with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, you have two parallel training corpuses coming through, and it's parallel text. Now the challenge is, how do you represent a word from the text into a vector, convert that into a feature store? So the most common way of doing that today is something called an embedding layer. You start, you create an embedding layer as your input layer. So let's say if my input has the vocabulary dog, cat, giraffe, fox, bird, etc., and for each of them I randomly initialize each of them. Dog is a vector of you know the vector of this, the string here, uh, the numbers here. Same with the cat. So I start off with initial uh, random initialization, and I run it through something called a word to vec. I convert that into a word to vec. And uh, so once I convert that into a word to vec, and uh, this is what I get. It, it kind of learns the real values and comes up with better values than what I started off with randomly. So the one big challenge we have with building machine translation models is, uh, especially languages like German, which have huge vocabulary and uh, extremely long comprehensions that are impossible to pronounce, are how do you deal with those uh, unseen vocabulary? And uh, the, the text you get for training is very limited. It's got very limited vocabulary. For example, the demo I'll be showing you, it's a German to English uh, machine, uh, neural machine translation model. And uh, it was trained with only 30,000 German words. But you, I, I kind of found that it can handle the rest of the unseen words. So how do you handle the unseen vocabulary? OK, so let's say if my text has only 30,000 words, what do I do about the rest, the rest of the vocabulary? How do I account for that? So this was one of the challenges that was solved by something called uh, byte pair encoding, uh, BPE as they call it. And uh, here's the paper about that from uh, University of Edinburgh. And uh, so the way byte pair encoding works is, if this is my input text, positional, edition, contextual, I take the most frequently occurring consecutive bytes and replace that by a different byte. So an example is, here in this, I see that TI and TI are occurring more often. So I can replace ti with an x. Now I can kind of go, go that path recursively. I can replace ix and ix with something else. And I can, you know, my input size becomes from this to this. It kind of narrows down my input size. So yeah, I can keep going recursively on this. So yeah. So what you had becomes this, finally. So your input size, it's kind of like a model compression. Your eventually model size is going to be much smaller than what it would, it would have been without byte pair encoding. So, and your models can, you know, uh, they have a, they're storing a function, they're learning the translations, and they can decode that back. So, and the other challenge that we have is, if you're training uh, deep learning models, you're dealing with a cluster of GPUs. And if your input text comes as you know a different lens, if the input one of them is very small, like only five words, the next sentence has got uh, 20 words. And if your input text is kind of in, not in a good order, it's not sorted out, sorted up front, then you are not optimally utilizing your GPU cluster. So you deal with something called jagged tensors, and uh, this is how it would look. So if the max if the max vocabulary size is 17 per sentence, so if the first one has only 14, the next one four, blah blah blah. So you can kind of see that it's not sorted out. So it makes sense to pre-sort your input upfront before sending it to the GPUs for training your models. And uh, so this is how you would do that. And now you can break this up into chunks and send each chunk to different GPUs on the cluster for training. So those different batches. Okay, so this is how you do the model training. 
And uh, so the thing that we have taken into uh, factor here is number one, create an embedding layer and uh, use byte pair encoding to account for unseen words and then sort your inputs to avoid jacket tensors and optimally utilize your GPUs. So you have trained your machine learning model, attention network model offline in a batch mode. Now how do you deploy that in a streaming pipeline for real-time inference or real-time, uh, if I'm Amazon and if I want to translate my content into from German to English or English to French, how do I do that in real time? So that's where you, you can, uh, we'll be looking at, that's the next part of the talk, streaming pipelines. So for this particular uh, demo, we have used Flink. Since uh, we had a talk about Beam this morning, we can as well use Beam with the Flink binding. And uh, the s normal steps in any uh, natural language processing is you do a language detection first, and then you do a sentence detection. So break up your input into sentences based on the language. And then you tokenize each sentence into b individual words. And then you run your byte, byte pair encoding. So the model in this case, I've deployed the model on Amazon SageMaker, but you can as well run it as an RPC server locally or use any model server. Uh, so here is the complete pipeline in Flink for this demo. And uh, so I just got the, yeah. So this is how the inference pipeline would look. So for this demo, I'll be using Twitter as input source. And uh, I'm running it through an open NLP, bunch of open NLP for sentence detection for German. And I'm using uh, an RPC client for, doing the demo, for running the inference. So here is where I need some help from you guys. The Germans can, if they can start tweeting, I would really appreciate that. If not, I'll just pull the German tweet feed as is. Uh, OK. Ready? OK. okay let me uncomment my German. So it's starting up a Flink cluster, and I'm running this as a Flink job. I'm putting the job on the cluster, and uh, it's going to be making an RPC call to SageMaker, a REST API call to SageMaker for getting the model inference. So let's wait for the tweets to come. First time hashtag German tweets, please. First time. FOSTEM, FOSTEM 2019 or FOSTEM 19, either one. I mean, if that doesn't work, that's fine. I can just pull off the normal uh, German tweet feed. So while that's running, any questions that you would like to answer? Okay, I'm not having luck with first time hashtag in German, so let me just uh, comment that out and just run the normal one. Okay. Yeah, that's not first damn tweet, but anyway, that's a German tweet. Uh, okay, so the first line is the actual German tweet, and the second one is a translation. The line following that is a translation in English. Um, so I guess, what do you think about the translation? Is it good? Com I think it's pretty good compared to, compared to Google Translate. It's as good as Google Translate, if not better. I'm critical of Poland when you start to shut down Windows, namely, okay, yeah. Anyway, so this is, uh, yeah, some of them are abusive and racist, so let's ignore that, yeah. Uh, okay, so any questions? So here are some links. Uh, the attention paper from Google, attention is all you need, and uh, the slides, we'll update the slides. Yeah, questions please, yeah. One, yeah. Yeah, we use byte pair encoding. So byte pair encoding is, you know, you take a, yeah, every successive bytes and replace that with, with a common byte, yeah. So basically what the advantage of that is your model size is much smaller and it's kind of like a data compression. So it's, it's a smart technique, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so the one thing I did not mention is this model was trained using a World Machine Translation WMT corpus, our Europal corpus, and it's all open source. But, uh, and I had used only 30,000 words, German words, in the actual training model. Okay, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it works fine for uh, you know, all kinds of tweets that come through. So if you look at this. Uh, for uh, technical stuff, I would say, uh, uh, say same size. You can train it on Wikipedia. You should be fine, too. We have trained it on Wikipedia or any technical stuff. Yeah, third, I mean, if you're using byte pair encoding, I think you pretty much cover most. It, uh, it's more, you can generalize your model to cover technical text as well as tweets, as well as news. Yeah. Time's up. Yeah. Thank you. I can answer this, yeah? Oh, yeah sorry. So how do you translate long German words, right? You don't really have in your dictionary? Is this a question? Uh, okay, yeah. So the way this, um, yeah. so the way this works is um, the BPE will um, compress the word to smaller units, and the model knows how to trans tra um, translate these little parts of the words. So it doesn't really look at the entire word, but it's like the, um, the um, new um, tokens it gets from the BPE process, and that's why this uh, works. Any more questions? Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh. You can take it off here and then uh, clip if you want. I don't know. And you're speaking alone, right? It's easier. Yes. So I guess you put something in your pocket. I would put it. Uh, Close up, so okay. to speak for us loud is uh, very bad acoustics. Okay. See it. 